Well, welcome back. I hope everybody had a great break and um, feel refreshed and ready to start again. So, uh, first off, you all have your exams back, and again, scores were really, really high. Maybe I'm making them too much like the practice exam. Some people told me that. So I should change it up a little more to challenge some of you more, I think. Um, so uh, I try to do that, but you guys are doing extremely well. Uh, the key is posted in the usual place, exam schedule. I don't think I need to go over it. Everybody did really well. If anybody has any, not everybody, but almost everybody, if um, anybody has any questions about their individual exam, I'll let you out a little bit earlier and you can ask me. How's that sound? Okay. And it's uh, just look at, go to our website, exam schedule, and the key's there. Okay, so let's get going on this. So this is the start of exam three material here. So uh, we're going to look at what to do when we have nonlinear data. Remember, we've been building these linear models. And what happens uh, if the data is not linear? Right, so we're going to look at how we might be able to, there are certain classic transformations, transformations of the variables, the x or the y variable, that you can do to make the plot more linear. So that's what today's lecture will be about. That and then um, how to, how to uh, interpret the coefficient, we'll get a, once the data is more linear in the transform variables, how to interpret those coefficients, the slopes. In, and the intercepts in the transformed variables, how to build confidence intervals. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. Chapters 28 and chapters 29 in your homeworks. On those chapters, uh, your Wednesday homework is posted. So, remember we have these four assumptions we've been talking about that we need to, uh, that we need to use a linear model for inference, not just to do descriptive statistics, but to, uh, make inferences. All right, so, um, so let's start. So to check those assumptions, you can either look at the scatter plot or most people look at the residual plot because it's usually easier to spot assumption violations by looking at the residual plot. And there, so let, what do I mean by that? So first, the first uh, assumption is that we have is linearity, that the relationship between x and y is linear. So the ideal uh, scatter plot should show a linear trend, and the residual plot should appear as a random scatter. So here's what the ideal would look like. And let's just look in the positive quadrants here right now. So let's look at x and y being positive. So you have an x and a y. And the idea is this ideal is some elliptical shaped cloud that follows a linear pattern, right? So there's some kind of, and then we can make, we can uh, get the least squares line to predict y from x. All right, that's the ideal. And, but lots of times um, you'll see curvature or something else. This won't, for example, uh, often you'll see something that might be uh, you know, shaped differently. Like, so if you tried to, you know, be some curve, and we wouldn't, you could either fit a curve to it, if, uh, or you could transform the data to be more linear. But right now, you don't want to fit a line to it. That's not the best fit. Okay, so this is bad. Um, you know, another classic bad pattern that you'll see a lot looks, you know, just like that. There's a lot of different ones, but, you know, you, you don't want to fit a line to something that shows definite curvature. Okay? So you don't want to do that either. So those two things are bad. So why would you want to, what do I even mean by looking at a residual plot? Um, the residuals are the errors. Remember what a residual is? Like the residual for this point right here is the distance off, it's the regression line. 
it's the actual minus the predicted. So if you look at um, residuals, you could either look at it as, um, you know, there's positive and there's negative, right? So let's say we wanted to plot x, which is in this case just positive, against the residuals. So here would be x. So they'd be centered at 0. The residuals are on the y-axis. And so if we wanted to change that, what would it look like? Well, for example, that point would just be, it's just, this is, it's just the um, height of the residuals for each individual x. So for this x, the height would be about there, etc. And so you just have, it's basically just the same plot, but um, it's easier to read. You can look at it more easily. And this is especially true. I mean, here you can look at them equally easily. This is especially true, as you'll see in your homework, when you have, um, you can change the scale. So let's say there were very small errors, very small errors relative to the x and y's. Well, then this axis can expand those errors. And so you can see a pattern that you might not be able to see when you look at x and y. And that's a problem in your homework. You're going to look at the solar system data where we can make very good predictions in this particular data set um, of y versus x. And uh, when you look at the residual plots, you can see patterns that don't show up in the regular, in the xy. So that's your homework for Wednesdays. So you can check that out. So for example, this would look like what? Here I'm just, it looks just as easy to spot a violation here in the x, y is when you plot the residuals on the y-axis. These are the residuals against the x's. You can also plot the residuals against the y's. That's another way you can do it. But here, the more usual is the residuals against the x's. Okay? So it would just look like what? <clears throat> These have positive residuals right there. These from here to here are negative, so we're just going to show the curvature like that. And it's just etc. Okay, and this one be 0 and x, and it would just, it's basically just straightening it out. So you have a horizontal line right across 0 if you don't change the scale. And then it's really not that much easier to see one way or the other. But everybody examines the residual plots because sometimes it's much, much easier to see violations in the residual plots. And it will never be easier to see it in these plots compared to those. OK, any questions on that? So that's the violation of linearity and independence. Independence is um, all uh, our models. Are, this independence uh, assumption is extremely important. And it says that the errors in our, the true underlying you know, regression model must be mutually independent. And another way of thinking of this is, can we model our data as random draws from a larger population if it's ra or as random assignment to an experimental condition? Basically, you don't want any clumping or grouping. You don't want, you see this a lot in time-dependent data, that you'll have patterns so that um, if you know the error on, so you can, uh, you know that, uh, if the error in one area for one x will be uh, as positive, then the error for the next x will be more likely to be positive, et cetera. It happens a lot in time-dependent data, but it happens if you have um, basically any kind of clumping or grouping. OK, so ideally, again, you just want these. The ideal is just like that. We can draw it again. The ideal would just be. Um, you know, this elliptical shaped linear. And we don't want any clumpings. Like, what do I mean by that? So bad would be like this. If you still had this linearity, we're not doing curvature. We still have this linearity. It looks pretty random. But we might have things like, OK, a whole group right there. And then another group maybe here. And um, another group like this, like that. So you still have this linear trend. But this would be particularly bad because, like, this is really, if this is x here. So if, you're, if x there's a, is in this area, you know that 
the errors are going to be about the same distance here. They're dependent on the x's. And why it's, for one thing, uh, it looks like you have each one of these individual points is really, you wouldn't have as many points as you really have. Your n, because if you know one, um, if you know an x down here, you know, you have a very good idea what the y is. So you really don't have as much independent observations as you think you do. You'd have to adjust your sample size. You really don't have as big a sample size as you think you do. As, not as you think you do, as the number of points indicate. I mean, let's say a town had a lot of triplets or um, quadruplets, right? So if you, and they, you're measuring them on some characteristic, let's say height and weight. Well, if you know the height of one triplet, you'll probably know the, and the weight, you'll know it will be the same for the other ones. So you wouldn't have as many independent observations as you think you have. Something like that would be non-independence. And it would show up as clumps. All right, so this is ideal and this is bad. I don't think I need to show the residual plots again, do I? I mean, it's just the same as you can, you can imagine turning these horizontal, right? All right, how about um, equal variability? Well, the variability of y should be the same across all values of x. We've talked about that a lot. It's called homoscedasticity. So you want to check that the spread around the regression line should be the same. So what you see often is a fan-shaped in, in lots of data sets. In lots of our STAT100 data sets, we violate equal variability. And what you see, the ideal, I'm not going to draw the ideal over and over again. You know what the ideal looks like. But a fan shape would be a bad, a very classic violation of this. So this is a bad plot. We'd have to do something about it. You still have the linearity. You don't have groupings. But you don't have equal, you have like, it looks almost like a fan, right? I'll draw the outline. So why is that bad? So you have this line here. But, the very, but you don't have, depending on, as x gets bigger, the errors get a lot bigger. So that's, a, that's um, we have to do something to correct for that. You can't, remember, we're using the same um, estimate for the standard deviation of the errors across all the x's. And this violates that. Okay, so um, this is the fan shaped that comes up a lot, and you have to transform the variables or do something else. You just can't go ahead and fit a linear model to it. Okay, and then the last is the normality of the errors around the. I better draw an ideal here because you might not understand this so well. Okay, so you have a. Let's just do the y and the x. And um, the ideal it looks like this random, but look, so you have this you have this elliptical shape. But with any within any vertical strip like this, what you want, and let's say we draw the regression line. We want normally distributed errors. So imagine like a little normal plot there, which means we want many more close to the regression line and much fewer out further away. So within any, any vertical strip, we want a little normal curve around the regression line, centered at the regression line, so meaning a lot more points here and a lot fewer there. So that would be ideal as opposed to See, it's not violating fan shape. It doesn't have clumping. It still has linearity. But this could be a violation looking something like I'll draw the elliptical shape. I'll do a real, and let's say I had, there's the regression line. But within a vertical strip, it might not be normal. I mean, you could have very few here in some vertical strips and lots of errors way out here. So it's, it could be the opposite of normal. You know, let's, I can make it a little bigger so you can see. That just means you have a lot of points here and a lot of points here, and you don't have very many close. 
So when you drew, draw a histogram, how do you check this? You don't check this through a residual plot. You check this, well, there are a number of ways you check it, but the simplest way to understand it is you could look at the, to see if the histogram of the errors look normal. What is the histogram of the errors? Like, they should look normal. So in here, they would appear normal. The histogram would be like what? You'd have this histogram centered at zero. Most of the errors are at zero. So you'd have this a tall block at zero. And then as you get further, this is zero. And as you get further away, you know, those are positive errors. It would be symmetrically distributed around zero. And then there'd be negative errors. And it would resemble the normal curve. That's the ideal. Remember, we're using these normal curves to build confidence intervals. And that's the ideal. But if you had something like this, this would be the exact opposite. You'd have what? You'd have a um, centered at zero, you have very few. Around zero, zero, remember, what I'm talking about here is all, we have a lot of very big, and a lot of very small residuals. Around zero, we don't have very many. So you could have something like really different than that, you know, like, or you could have skewed or, you know, I'm making it sort of exaggerated, but something like that, that's not normal. All right, any questions on that? And all the, you know, in our data program, you can, look at um, the residual plots. We can look at them in a little bit, and you can look at the histograms of the residuals. But that's the idea. So what do you do with these violations? So there's two, there's classic ones that you can do. So let's look at this. What do you do to correct for these? And um, so if it, follows a nonlinear pattern, you can try these following steps to make the plot look linear and to make the errors around the regression line more normal. So um, first you look at the histogram of the Ys. Okay? And if it's symmetrical, leave it as it is. All right? But if it's right skewed, so if it's symmetrical, Leave it as it is, like that. This is the histogram of the y variable, OK? Now, if it's right skewed, what does right skewed mean? Let's just look at the positive here, positive y's. Right skewed would mean what? That it has a long right-hand tail. So if it's right skewed, it could be something like that right skewed. And if you want to, make, want to make that look more normal, what do you want to do? You want to take these really big values and move them in to make it more normal. So if you took the square root, wouldn't that affect the big values more than the small values? The square root of 1 is 1. The square root of 4 is only going to reduce it to 2, but the square root of 100 will reduce it all the way to um, 10. So you'll bring these values in more. The bigger the value is, the more extreme the square root transformation. And the log would be an even more extreme, even more, if you know, that might not work. You could first try the square root, and it might not be uh, extreme enough. But the log is the exponent, so that would really bring it in. Like a million, let's say this goes all the way out to a million, well, log base 10 would bring it down to 6. And uh, whereas log base 10 of 1 would just bring it to 0. 1 would go to 0. 10 would go to 1. And a million would go to 6. So if it was spread out from, from 1 to um, a million, you'd change it to go to zero, the scale to 0 to 6. And it would look more normal. Now, if it was less skewed, left skewed, it's the opposite. So what do we want to do if it's left skewed? If it's left skewed, that means there's this long trail here, and then this big hump here. So now what do we want to do? We want to do the opposite. We want to take, we want to square 
because squaring will affect the big numbers more, right? Just it's the same logic, and will spread this out more. Um, cubing would do even more, and e to the um, y would be extreme. That would be a very extreme transformation. Mostly you'd stick with the squares. Here I said you could do 1 over y, but that reverses the direction. So the biggest number becomes the smallest, and it's, that's hard to interpret. So that's rarely used. But this, these two are used all the time. And the square is the most common here. Um, so we can give you an example of this. Um, let's look at our own data, and I'll show you what I mean. So um, the log transformation is you run into all the time. So many things are actually under, on the log scale. So let's look at, let's go to the computer here. And for example, some survey, our own survey data, you can't, uh, you can't even see it until you transform it to logs. So let's look at, for example, questions about income. So I asked you guys, question 19, 20 years down the road, this is your data from survey two, how much money do you expect to make per year in thousands? This was one of the questions. And if you look at the histogram without any transformations, look what it looks like. It just looks like all you see is this giant spike. Here's the statistics around zero. Well, nobody answered zero. Let's see what they are. The um, minimum answer was 1,000. This is in thousands. And the maximum answer was we cut it off at what? A hundred thousand thousand, so that's a hundred million. That's where we just decided to cut it off the salary. So some people answered that. Now the median was 150,000, and the average was a million five hundred and sixty thousand. But you, all we can see is these people who answered, because to fit these answers on it, you have to make the scale such that nobody's answer shows up. So. In fact, when we first look at this, when I show, they think something's wrong. It's, and there's nothing wrong. It's just we can't see any information unless we change it. Because we want to count each person's answer equally. We want to look at all your answers. And there's no way you can see them unless you go to a log scale. Well, we could try a square root transformation first, see what that does. It helps a little bit, but still it's very right skewed. But now when you go to the log, well, now things show up. And you can actually build confidence intervals. We want to see everybody's answers. We don't want these people who answered 100 uh, million to just completely, the, the fitting program can't see, the, the, the data can't do both, because otherwise it'd have to have a scale so big. You, they can't fit everybody's answers. So people who answer, you get, most of the classes all clumped together. This is true of so much data in nature. It's true, everything, most, so many things are on a log scale. So it, in order to even see or make sense of data, you, usually, you often have to change it to log. And probably a lot of you know this if you do any science. OK. So there is a good example. And, um, and now, you, now things show up. This is, this is interesting data. If you want to look at, um, uh, let's get out of the log scale for a minute. Um, you can choose a split by groups. By, I'm curious, let's say by ethnicity. And it will be interesting. What do you, who do you think is going to expect to earn the most? We could do an eye clicker question. Um, all right, let's have A, B, whites. Who do you think is going to answer the expected um, B, B, East Asian? What do we have? Whites, East Asian, South Asian, and other. Other is blacks, Hispanics. There weren't enough of them, so I put them into one group. So there's whites, East Asians from China and um, Korea, South Asians from India, Pakistan mainly, and then um, other. So let's try it. So that's A, B, C, and D. I'm curious what you think. And OK, so choose A for whites, B for Chinese, Koreans, et cetera, C for Indians, Pakistanis, that's South Asian, and D for other, that's blacks, Hispanics, mostly. This 
this is what they think they'll earn. Just who do you think's the most, going to say the most? I actually don't know. <laughs> I haven't looked at this yet. I just, I know what I'd guess. Okay, does everybody have an answer? A, B, C, or D? All right. So let's see what you said. I'm going to stop it now. And what did people say? Okay, so people thought whites would be the, are going to give the highest answer, then um, East Asians, then South Asians, then other. All right, let's see. That's what you thought. And um, let's do the split. We have to split plots. Look, everybody looks the same. We can't even see it from there. We have to look at the statistics. Whoa, South Asians are skyrocketing compared to everybody else. Um, we can look at the median and the average. So the median would be probably more reliable with the sample sizes aren't so big here. The median's the middle person. So still the South Asians, 200. East Asians, 145,000, 200,000. 145,000. Whites are 125 and others 120. But if you look at, there's a bigger standard deviation here. So the averages is, are different. So there's 100, and, of the people who answered the survey, there's 108 East Asians, 30 South Asians, 27 other, and 52 whites. Hmm. Let's split by sex too. Do you mind? Do you want to do another split? Do you want to say, I bet the women are less. Don't you all agree? The, the women are going to say less, but let's see if it's the same throughout. This will be interesting. Okay, so we're going to choose another split. This is why statistics is so much fun. Okay, so now we're going to do another variable, and now we'll do gender. Okay? Now we'll do our splits again. We have all these splits. We can't see anything cause, until we log it, but let's just do the statistics. Oh, my gosh. Look at the South Asians. Twice as... Now, there's a huge disparity between males and females. Three, the females are only half the expected income as the males. Whereas everybody else, it's very similar. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. There must be a lot of rich South Asians, like rich Indians or something, that come to the school, probably. So there's more, so the females feel like there's more gender disparity. Like they don't feel like there's a huge gender disparity, but they're both feel like they're going to be well off. There's the least gender disparity here. The numbers aren't so big except for the East Asians. Interesting. Well, you're all very hopeful that you're going to do really well. You're going to make it, this is like adjusted income, right? Like, you know, adjusting for inflation, right? I hope you all knew that. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. So given, you know, adjusting for inflation, you guys expect to do really well. I hope so. I hope so. Somebody said 1,000. Oh, that would be sad. Okay. <laughs> so let's log it and see. Now we see, we can see better. See, once you do the log, you can see things a little better. Okay, so that's the idea. So let's go back to our data now. Oh, we can do another eye clicker. Um, just to make sure you understand the basics here. What do I have on here? On page 150, all right. If you have a data set, well, you know this already. Let's do this one. All right, to make a right skewed, to make a right, let's do this, to page 155, we're doing part B, if it's right skewed, to make it more symmetrical, what would you try first? I should start this. What would you try first if you want to make it more symmetrical? We're doing B on page 150. I jumped the gun here. I wasn't supposed to. Let's, let's do this when we get to it. I'm sorry. This is too easy now. This is page 155. You can answer anything since we started it. We'll give you credit for anything. Just answer something so you have something. 
so you don't lose credit on this one. Okay, just answer. We're not going to pay any attention to it. All right. We'll do this one when we get to page 155. All right, let's go to the document camera. All right. And so now, um, so if right skewed, you take the square root first. Then to make a more extreme, you do the, the log. And this one rarely is used. Now, what do you do next? You look at the scatter plot with the transformed y and see if it's linear. All right, so back to our uh, the example. We're going to be doing an example in a minute. If not, try doing the same transformation on the x variable. Then if the data is straight enough, you fit a regression line, you find the residuals and the predicted values. And then what you do is um, you look at the residual plots, right? And make sure it has no pattern. This is exactly what we did. Make sure it's no pattern. Make sure that independent, none of the, none of the um, assumptions are violated. So this is what we do after we fit a regression line. So this is just as on the previous page. I mean, you can't get the residuals until you get linearity and fit a regression line. Then you can look at the residual plots. Right? So that's the idea. All the five conditions, OK? If everything looks OK, um, and if all the five conditions are met, then you're ready to go, and you can make confidence intervals and build confidence intervals and make inference about a larger population, like we always do. OK, so that's what we're going to do. All right. So here's a cool example. I should find this. This is body weight and brain weight of 34 species of land animals. So let's go look for this one. And let's look for it. And All right, where is this one? Okay, it's really 34 animals. I have it wrong here. 32, it says, but it's really 34 animals. All right. And so now let's look at the scatter plot. And we're going to predict, we're going to choose X body weight and brain weight. And look at this. So you see all these animals. There's 34 of them, I think. Statistics, are there 34? Yeah, N is 34. They're all scrunched together. What is it, a mouse, a kangaroo? I can't even see it. Chimpanzee, Reese's monkey. You can't even see these animals. It's just that they're just so scrunched together here. All right? And if we fit a regression line, it says it's negative. It's slightly negative. The bigger the body weight, the smaller the brain. Right? And who's this way up here? There's an animal that has a huge body weight, a little brain. Excuse me, a little body weight and a huge brain. This must be a very smart animal. Oh, yeah, it's an elephant. This must, that's an elephant, too. And here, what's this? This is a huge body, no brain, almost. And that's a brachiosaurus, a dinosaur. They died out. OK, so. We want to do some transformations here, right? And so that's what we're talking about. So this is, this is what you have in your notebook. So we go back to the document camera. And we say, all right, so there's 10 species of dinosaurs and 24 species of mammals here. And notice how once you make the scale big enough to see the big dinosaurs here, most of the points are scrunched around 0. Both for, for both weights, you just can't see them. Like we, we saw a kangaroo, we saw some kind of monkey, we, it, it, we couldn't, a mouse, we couldn't see all the animals there. You can hardly see them, and neither can the fitting program. It can't see them, which pays little attention to these small numbers. It's exactly like what we had with our uh, income problem. Um, yet that's where most of the animals are, and you want to make a transformation 
that counts the little animals just as much as the big ones. We want to see the relationship between body and brain for all the animals. And so it made me this, whenever I think of this, I always think of um, the Dr. Seuss book, Horton, Here's a Who. So a person's a person, no matter how small, that the people down in Whoville, it's a wonderful book if you've never read it. It's a children's book, and it's my favorite Dr. Seuss book. Horton, Here's a Who. He, he has to, you have to really have elephant-type ears to hear these tiny little, basically you have to do a log transform so that the, the little animals can be heard. Dr. Seuss was a, a big, uh, very, very, uh, he was an anti-fascist. He was very pro-democracy. And so many of his books, as you know, have some kind of moral message, some kind of political message. And this is my favorite political message of that everyone, no matter who they are, should have an equal voice. And logarithms, basically, when you're looking at data, can help us, especially when you're looking at income stuff. OK? So that's um, where that comes from. So is the scatter plot linear? No, that's not linear. No, so now we have to follow our steps. We transform. OK, so now here's going to be your eye clicker, because we're going to look at, let's go back to the PC. And so now we're going to look at this histogram, right? So let's, take, let's go to home, and let's look at a histogram of what? We want to hit, look at a histogram of the Y, so the brain weight. And see how it's, this is the same one you have in your notebook. And now I want to answer question. Uh, so now this is the eye clicker question that I want you to answer. And so now we say, all right. So first off, because people forget the language here, so I'm going to go to this one. You might not know this. So look at that histogram. What best describes it? You know it's not symmetrical. But do you, do you know if it's right skewed or left skewed? Let's get the language down. All right, let's stop it. And the answer is, I hope you answered B, that it's right skewed. OK, but a lot, don't worry if you, some people still said symmetrical, even though I told you it's not symmetrical. Oh, OK. All right, it's right skewed. Now, um, let's go to the next one. And uh, what's the next one? OK, to make it more symmetrical, this is part B in our notebook. We might as well just do it here. To make it more symmetrical, what would you first try? OK, a few more seconds here. Everybody had a chance to answer? All right, I'm going to stop it. And the answer should be A. You'd first try that. Great. OK, and then that's good. So you can fill that in in your notebook. And then the next one is, what did I ask next? If the histogram were left skewed, you would first, that's part D. What would, you, what would you do if it was, sorry, i got to move that up. So if it was left skewed, that's part D in your notebook. The, if the histogram was, were left skewed, what transformation would you first have tried? All right, just a few more seconds, and then we'll fill this page in in our notebook and then go on to the next. All right, stop it. And you'd first try y squared, right? Great. Terrific. OK, so now let's just go back 
to, um, let's see, whoops, let's go back to the data. Let's try it here. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so what would we try? We first we'll try this for this, and then we'll try the log. It looks better. Looks much better, the log of the brain weight, yeah. Okay, so let's fill that in on our document camera. And um, we have right skewed to make it f more symmetrical. We're first going to try the square root of y. And if that doesn't work, we're going to try, that's for this one, we're going to try the log of y. Okay, and that's what we did. And that's what it looked like. Depending on how you bin it, I tried to make it look, you know, I did different bins here, but it looks better than that one. And if it were left skewed, what would you have tried? Well, you'd try the y squared first. If that didn't work, you could use this. And if you want to get really crazy and extreme, you could do this, e to the y. Put the y in the exponent. All right. So let's turn the page. Now what are we going to do? Now we're going to take that log that transformed y and see if it's linear now. If not, we'll try doing the same thing with the x, OK? So let's do that. And here you can see that we, when we did it, does this look linear yet? Let's, let's, it's more fun to do it on the program. So let's just go back to the program. So here, we're going to go back to the program here and do it here. So we're going to take that scatter plot and we're going to say body weight on the x and brain weight. All right, now what have we done so far? By the way, this program says, notice it says log. That looks like log base 10. It's not. It's natural log. It's log base e. Even though the program writes it log x, and I always say log, I'm always, we're always going to be doing log base e. It's just much more convenient. This is log base 10, but don't believe it. It's all log base e. All right, so we're going to do the y variable is what we did. And that should be exactly what you see in your notebook. And does it look linear? No, it fits these. Like it's fitting the Brachiosaurus. And it's fitting, but look at the elephants. They're still way up there. Who's this? Who do you think that is? That's going to be a smart, another smart animal with a big brain relative to its body. Who's that? See, now you can see some of these, sep these little animals better who they are, but it's certainly not a good linear fit. Who they are. Tyrannosaurus rex. That was a smart, for dinosaurs, pretty smart. Diplodocus. So these are the dinosaurs out this way. All right. So what are we going to do next? What do you think we should do? It's not, now what we could do is we could try we have the log y. We should also try the log x. And look how much better it is now. So now we log both of them. And that's the bottom picture you see. And it looks a lot better, a whole lot better. Like the cat is right here, and that fits beautifully. Um, who's this? The human still, we could do better. I bet these over here are probably all dinosaurs. Yeah, these are all the dinosaurs here. So we have sort of two groups, but this is much, much better. All right, so let's go to the document camera now. And it says, after taking the logs, first of all, let's fill in what we have yet here. Was it linear when we just did the log of the brain? No. Now we did both, and we read it. Now we have two logs. And by the way, we should write that these are all LNs, log base E, OK? Everything you see in the data program is log base E. All right, now after taking the logs of both weights, we get a plot where the animals show up. The fitting routine sees all the points about equally. It comes with, up with a linear model. Here's our linear model in, um, in a decent R. Look at how our R now is much better, much better. Look, our R improved tremendously. But remember, it was slightly negative before? Like here, it was terrible. 
was almost zero and it was negative. So we have a much better R and we have a linear equation in logs. The log of the brain weight is equal to about three plus, here's our um, slope times the log of the body weight. So here's our linear equation and here's our standard deviation of the errors. All right, so now let's work with this linear equation and make predictions. And we still, it's not great. We saw the human has a pretty big residual. If There's a really nice fit right here for the cat. But the dinosaurs aren't doing great, and these elephants aren't doing great. But right in the middle, it does pretty good. All right. So now, on the next page, so if the data is straight enough, we're going to fit a regression, find the residuals, da 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 and the predicted values. So let's just... This is for those of you who are rusty working with logarithms, you might have to review your rules of exponents. All right, so here I rounded the equation I just showed you. I rounded it here. And um, here's our rounded equation that we had on the previous page. Okay, so the, the log of the brain weight in grams, and this is the body weights in kilograms. And the standard deviation of the errors has no units because logs have no units, and this is the, they're just exponents. And so this is errors in the log equation. All right. So now use the equation to find the brain weight of a cat, given the cat in that um, the cat over here has a weight of about 3.3 kilograms. All right. So we're just going to make a prediction. So, okay. So first, find the log of the brain weight. Well, the log of the brain weight is equal to, we're just going to use this, 3 plus 0 0.32 times the log of 3.3. All right, that's all we're going to do. And I did that, and I got 3.382. All right, so that's the log of the brain weight but we want the brain weight. So we just have to anti-log both sides, right? So we take, exponentiate both sides. E, just in case you're rusty, should I even, you won't be, I don't want to insult people, but what I, all I'm doing is taking E to that, E to both sides, okay? So then E to the log of the brain weight, that anti-logs it, and you get the brain weight equals e to the 3.382. Okay? And that is going to be the brain weight. Now that all, it has units, it's in grams. So if we did that, we get grams. 29.43 grams. Okay, so that is the brain weight. Let's, of the kitty. Now, the actual brain weight of the cat is this. So what's the residual? Well, remember the residual? The residual, you know, is just equal to the actual minus the predicted. So it's going to be equal to the actual is 25.6, and the predicted is 29.43 in grams. So we'll subtract that, and we get negative 3.83 grams. Let's see if that makes sense. Let's look at the cat on the other pa on the page. And the cat is a tiny bit. It's a very good prediction for the cat. Very good prediction. The cat um, the, in logs, this is logs, was what, 3.382? That looks about right. That was the prediction for it, and it's slightly below it. All right, now let's do humans. Use the equation to find the brain weight of a human who's 62 kilograms. That's the one pictured in the plot. So it's this human. It's going to have a prediction much less than what it actually is. So let's look at that. So let's do that. So the log, we have to use, we're using this equation, the log equation. So it's the log of the brain weight. The log of the brain weight is equal to, I'm just copying that down, 3 plus 0 0.32 times the log of the weight in kilograms, 62. And uh, I got 4.32.
That's the predicted log. Is that about right? That's like right here, predicted on the line. Yeah, it looks about right. But it's, the actual is much bigger. OK, so that's the predicted log. Oh, they want, but it's asked for the brain weight, not the log of the brain weight. So what do we have to do? Anti-log both sides, exponentiate both sides. So we get, you know, just put an e there and e there, right? And so e to the log of the brain weight is the brain weight. And that's equal to e to 4.32, which is 75.24 grams. That's the predicted for the brain weight. Now, the actual, it's going to have a big residual, remember? Because look at the actual. 1320 minus 75.24. Right, which is 1,247.76. That's a giant residual compared to the cats. A giant residual. Positive residual because the, it's not a great fit for uh, the human. We can look. See? It's a very big residual, positive residual, that was good for the cat, but not great for... We're going to do better. We're, we can do better. Uh, if we split it into two groups, do mammals fit two separate regression lines, mammals and dinosaurs? We'll do that next time. But for now, let's just keep it like this. All right, so now um, we've got this equation in logs. Let's change it back to an equation in terms of brain weight because it's more intuitive for most people to work in um, the actual weights rather than the logs. All right? Oh, yes, it has, it is 44, right? Yep, sorry. Sorry, I copied it down wrong. Is that right? Thank you. Thanks for that correction. Yeah, because it has to be, look at that. All right, now, um, now what are we going to do? So if we want to change this back, we're going to anti-log both sides. And basic in general, um, when you do that, look what happens, just so you know, make sure you don't make a mistake, that what happens if you take a log equation and you anti-log both sides, so you'll get y here, and then this intercept is going to be part of, this will be an exponent there, and this, the slope right there, will become an inter the exponent of your x. So let's see, we can do that. So when we, we'll just, so we have, what do we have? We have the log of the brain weight equals, I'm just copying this down, 3 plus 0 0.32 times the log of the body weight. All right, so now, If we exponentiate both sides, that means e to that and e to that whole thing, what do we get? Here we get the brain weight equals e to that whole thing, right? e to the 3 plus 0 0.32 times the log of the body weight. Sorry, it looks kind of messy there. But I just, this is, this whole thing's up in the exponent there, right? So that means I'm just going to simplify that. So the brain weight equals what? Let's simplify. That's e to the 3, right? That's, so you can see right away, that's what we talked about there. And then what? Plus, it's in the exponent, so that's times, times e to the 0 0.32 times the log of the body weight. It's this. But you, do you mind? I'm just going to write it. I'm just, it's commutative, so I'll put this first, just so you'll see it more clearly. 
times the 0 0.32, right? And now you know this whole thing, e to the log of the body weight is body weight, right? So this becomes e cubed times what? This whole thing right here it turns into what? Body weight. The x. Body weight raised to the 0 0.32. So that is our equation. So I know some people are rusty because you haven't even thought about this since high school. But most people in this class are probably just going, thinking, why is she even telling this? It's insulting. I'm sorry if you feel that way, but we have a big range of people in this class, and so it's not insulting to anybody. I really don't mean to be. All right, so now, um, so what if we had taken the log base 10 of x and log base 10 of y instead of the log base e? Um, would we have gotten the same equation? What do you think? Yes or no? What would have changed? What would, do you know what would change and what would not change? Anybody? What would change? Um, it's, the only thing that would change is the intercept, OK? The only thing that would change is the intercept. So the slope would not change. If you want to see it worked out, I can do it. But I'd just rather get on with, um, it's just, you just, I mean, it's very simple. Is it OK if we skip? Do you want me to work it out or not? Does anybody want me to work it out to show you that or not? If you want to see it, I can work it out after class for anybody. You don't really need to know that. OK, just know that only the intercept would change. All right, so now this is what you do need to know to do your homework. And, um, and this is very good preparation for uh, the section we're going to do after this on logistic regression. So this is computing confidence intervals for transformed variables. So we transformed the variables in order to get the errors around the regression line to be about normal. That means we can use the standard deviation of the errors right here. That's the rounded one. We can use that to compute confidence intervals. But this is for the log. It's for the transformed variables. So then we have to translate that back to a confidence interval for the actual variable that we're interested in, not the log of the uh, brain weight, but the brain weight itself. So let's do this. We, we do it in two steps. All right? So first of all, remember confidence intervals. Confidence intervals, so now we have these errors that are normally distributed, right? These, stand, these errors, the standard deviations of the errors. So that means that. Um, they're centered at 0. So between negative 1 and 1, remember that there's about 68% lie. And between negative 2 and 2, approximately 95% of the data lies. All right. So um, let's use the normal curve to make the calculations instead of the t or anything like that so we can focus on the ideas here. So a 95% confidence interval will be our estimate plus or minus two standard um, deviations of the errors. All right? So, um, so in a 68 would be one. So now let's translate. OK, so that's how we're going to do this now. So then after you build a confidence interval around the log, then you take those endpoints and change them, exponentiate them to the original variable. So let's do this. So here we have, we, this, is, uh, this is our equation, right? And we're using this right here for the errors. OK, and we estimated the brain weight of a 3.3 kilogram cat to be what? What did we do? We said, it's just from the previous page. We said the log of the brain weight was equal to 3 plus 0 0.32 times the log of 3.3. And we got, we got 
3.382. That's for the log. So then after we did that, but we want, so this is our estimate for the log. That's our estimate. But what we then want for the actual brain weight, then what did we do? For the brain weight, we took, we just said, so for the brain weight, it's going to be 3e to the 3.382. And we said that was, that's 29.43. So that's our estimate. This is our estimate right here for the brain weight. That's our estimated brain weight. I said brain weight. That's our estimated brain weight. Sorry, I'm skipping back and forth between how the abbreviation is in the da data program, which is BRWT in the more normal way. But that's our estimated brain weight. And what's this? This is our estimated log of the brain weight. OK. Now, to attach error bars around our estimates, we're going to use this. But remember, this is really important. This is for this. This goes with this one. It's for the log, not the brain weight. So we, if we, we have to start with this, this one, right? It's for the log, OK? So we're just going to do our usual way, a 95% confidence interval for the log of the brain weight is going to be our usual thing, OK? We're, right? So what will we do? So we want to say a 95% confidence interval for log of the brain weight is going to be this, 3.382 plus or minus 3.382 plus or minus what? 95% goes with what? 2, right? 2 times what? Standard deviations of the errors for, this is for log. This is for the log equation. So that's what we want to use, times 1.6. OK, this is nothing new. So we're just going to build it the usual way. So we get 3.382 minus 3.2, one, you know? And that's 0 0.182. And 3.382 plus 3.2. 3.2, we're adding that to 3.2. So we get 6.582. So that is for, so it's symmetrical here. You know, our estimate. This estimate is dead center here. But now watch what happens. Now, to get to the brain weight, if we wanted a confidence interval for the brain weight, we're going to antilog both these endpoints, which means what? Raising them, exponentiating them. So we'll have e, basically it's e to the 3.382 minus that. It's going to be that e to the 0.182. And this will be 2e to the 6.582. And when we do that, we get 1.2 to 722, about. And notice that our estimate, this estimate right here, is not in the center of that. It's much closer to the lower one, and it always will be. It's not, the confidence interval is symmetrical for the log brain weight because we're just adding and subtracting the same amount. But once we exponentiate, it's no longer, it's going to be asymmetrical for the brain weight. So the estimate for the brain weight, this, in other words, this estimate for the brain weight, which is what? 20, the estimate for the brain weight, 29.43, is not in the center of these two. It's much closer to this one. And in fact, it's equal to the geometric mean, not the arithmetic mean. The geometric mean. So you could 1.2, and you can convince yourself of that. It's very simple. And so that's the check you should do to make sure it's about equal to that. 
Ah, okay. So that's the check you should do. Because this right here is your estimate, and it's not the midpoint like you're used to. So we have these asymmetrical confidence intervals that are the geometric mean, not the arithmetic mean. Okay? And you can convince yourself of that very easily if you, because, look. You have these exponents, and you're adding, you added and subtracted the same amount off of them. So when you take the square root of it, it's just, if you want to see it, um, I don't want to bore you with the arithmetic you probably already know, but if you want to see it, I love to do that kind of thing, so just come up afterwards. All right, also if you want to um, uh, see your, uh, if you have any questions about your exams, that has first priority, so come up here. and. Uh, now you're ready to do your homework.